All right, we are live. Welcome, everybody. This is Dr. Michael Kay from the Center for Functional Health. And today I am honored to have with me Jill Hillhouse, who is certified as a nutritional practitioner. Jill, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, as I was just saying, I really love your book. This is Jill's book here. This is definitely everybody should get it. Paleo Diabetes Diet Solution. Absolutely love the book. I was just sharing with Jill that it is done well. It's written very well to where a layperson can pick it up and understand it. But more importantly, understand it where they can make sustainable changes in their life. So thank you for writing that great book. I really enjoyed it. It's a great reference. It now goes with me to the office so I can show patients this is what I'm talking about. So welcome, welcome. I'm finally glad we were able to get you on. And I can't wait to just pick your brain and go to town with it. Thanks so much, Michael. There's so much to talk about in the paleo world, but also in the blood sugar world. So there's a lot of stuff for us to dig into. Thank you for um, your kind words about the book. I really did try and lay out a book that is actionable and that people can read and do some stuff and read and understand a little bit. And we're going to dig into some blood tests, I think, in a bit. Um, so that was one area specifically that I wanted people to understand and not have to read through 250 pages to, to get one, one thing, uh, one actionable item they could use. Great. And if you can share with everybody what your background is and how you got into this whole diabetic world and the paleo world. Yeah, great. Um, my history as a nutritionist started, uh, well, my mother, maybe way back, <laughs> way, way back. Um, but in university, I studied physical and health education. So I was more in the fitness end of things and in that kind of world. But when I had children, the whole nutrition area became much more important to me, much more prevalent. Uh, and then I went back to school and studied holistic nutrition once my kids were in school. So I st I've been practicing in this field for about 20 years now and uh, have seen lots of changes in those 20 years. Mm -hmm. Fats come and go, different diets come and go, uh, and a whole bunch of things have, have um, stood the test of time. And over this time, blood sugar has become really uh, important to me and, and and a really a key thing that I look at with my clients because I see the same patterns over and over and over again. And blood sugar is not something that is usually discussed unless there is a diagnosis of prediabetes or diabetes. But it is so important even without those diagnoses. So it's uh, it's a key that I look at all the time with my clients. Yeah, I think it's super important. So my whole family had diabetes. Um, okay. Mom had it. Dad had it. Sister had it. I mean. And when in ninth grade, I told me, listen, we've got to start eating differently. They thought, oh, I had an eating disorder, right? Because I just didn't, you know, growing up in Philly, uh, Philadelphia area, you know, I didn't want to do the cheesesteaks and the pizza and yeah. just normal food fare, right? It was just, of course, it was normal to have a cheesesteak with, you know, double the cheese, double the meat, right? I mean, that yeah. was just normal. Of course, it was deli night and pizza night. And, you know, the amount of bread that was consumed and grains that were consumed during the week was just when I think about it now, it's just, it's astronomical. It's just amazing. And, you know, they were so caught up with, well, I didn't eat chocolate. So how come my blood sugar be high? Well, first of all, I know they would eat chocolate, you know, number one, you know, they didn't think about the ice cream, all the dairy they were eating, um, a soft pretzel and all the food, how, you know, it actually all counted. And, you know, they didn't really understand carbohydrates. You know, my father said, I don't know when my blood sugar is up. All I had was mcdonald's hamburger and fries right and they always equate it with diabetes that means you ate too many sweets you know so they, right. they can grasp it you know so we can talk about like carbohydrates because you know there's some people carbohydrates are bad well carbohydrates obviously are not bad you know we we do need carbohydrates what kind of carbohydrates do we need so if we can start with carbohydrates eating frequency and talk about aging and what happens when we have diabetes and how it creates that aging process. Okay, great. Carbohydrates is the absolute perfect place to start because there are so many people that do have that idea of, well, why is my blood sugar high or why is my blood sugar creeping up? I don't eat any sugar. So understanding exactly what carbohydrates are and how we digest them and how we metabolize them is really important. And when we think about the idea that, or the fact rather, that all of our foods have carbohydrates in them except our animal proteins. 
So those are the only things without any carbohydrates. And so all of our vegetables are carbohydrates, all of our fruits are carbohydrates, all of our dairy has carbohydrate, our beans and lentils have carbohydrates, and of course our grains do too, and our nuts and seeds. So there are carbohydrates in everything. It's just how many carbohydrates are there and how quickly are they gonna get digested down into sugar? Because as you know, but to share with your audience, carbohydrates are digested down into their individual components and those individual components are glucose molecules. And of course, glucose is sugar. So that is our blood sugar. When we digest those, all of that sugar ends up in our bloodstream. And then insulin has to come along and move that sugar out of the bloodstream and into the cells where it can get used for energy. So even if we don't eat any sugar, but we're eating a lot of grain, like mm -hmm. bread and pasta, and um, rice and stuff like that, we can still end up with a lot of sugar in our blood, a lot of glucose in our blood that can raise our blood sugar over time. And we can become pre-diabetic and diabetic, even if we don't eat any sugar per se. Right, so, so yeah. you know, and, and everybody thinks that, you know, but it's just a little bit of rice, right? And, you know, it shouldn't hurt me, you know, how can a grain cause a spike in my glucose, right. you know? and and, and then people say to me, but Dr. K, look at the Asian population, they eat rice and you know, they're, they're thin compared to like an American population. Um, but I also know that they're not eating bowls and bowls and bowls of rice. Like, you know, uh, American has a little more gluttonous to their consumption of it, right? So that's where the dosage makes the difference. Um, exactly. A little bit could be good. I mean, I stuck a continuous glucose monitor in me for a month. Right, um, yeah. And I wanted to see, you know, what foods really spike it. And I wanted to see how movement after I ate something actually brought my blood sugar level down, right? So I don't care that it goes up. I don't, you know, it's okay that it goes up a few points. That's mm -hmm. great. I just want it spiking up high and not be able to come down within a period of time. Right. So, you know, I had a slice of pizza because I had to try it out. And so we had, and we had a little bit increase uh, about 15, 20 points. But because I was walking afterwards playing basketball, it came down really fast. So I can say that activity after you consume uh, food is absolutely wonderful for bringing down that blood sugar. What's exactly. really interesting is the strawberries spiked me so high so fast. Yeah, yeah. I was really blown away by that. I mean, it, it, it spiked me higher than the slice of pizza did. And then I tried yeah. out with blueberries. And then I tried it again with strawberries, but I cut my dose in half and it didn't spike as high. So, you know, that, that dosage definitely makes a, a difference for sure. Um, right. Because the dosage is then you've, you know, you cut your cut, you cut the number of carbohydrates that you ate in half. Correct. Right? So you cut the number of glucose molecules floating around in your bloodstream by half. So, um, so that, that makes a huge difference. But mentioning that continuous glucose monitor is really interesting. My, a lot, I use it with a lot of my clients. And this is where the absolute biochemical individuality of every single person becomes incredibly apparent, apparent. Just as you said, the strawberries for you were worse than the pizza. Correct. You think that. In, in, normal, in a normal diabetic education session, you wouldn't think that. Correct. And you wouldn't ever say that. But when you get that chance to see it in yourself, wow, it, it makes a huge difference. And so this is where personalized medicine and personalized nutrition are really, people are really starting to understand how critical it is. Yes, there are ground rules, like sugar will spike your blood sugar. Sure. For sure right? And processed grain is likely going to spike your blood sugar too, like any grain that's been made into flour specifically. Right. But beyond that, it's individual. Right. And, uh, and it's really valuable to know that information. Now here in the States, you know, we can't get a CGM unit. I had to go, you know, I had to pay separately outside of the insurance because I wanted to just see, you know, it's about optimization. It wasn't, you can get it if you're a diabetic, but even, even my local docs are like, why do you want to do that? Just give them, give them the injection, you know, put them on metformin and, and walk away. And I'm thinking, okay, that's a good beginning. Why don't we want to know, right? We really want to know how we can control our blood sugar because it's really, really important. You, you know, can we talk a little bit about, because you, you touched just a bit on, about the, how we individually respond to food. So that gets us into like nutrigenomics. 
So right. if we talk yeah. about nutrigenomics, that would be great. Yeah. So, you know, our genes are set in stone. We all have genes. We got one, one gene from our parents, one gene from each parent, and that makes our own individual um, gene makeup. And it's set in stone. It won't change over your lifetime. But what will change over your lifetime is how various genes are expressed. And so from a nutrigenomic perspective, if you are, if you have a gene, a gene variant that predisposes you to snacking, predisposes you to not being satisfied, not having correct hunger cues, or predisposes you to not being able to produce and transport insulin very well, all of those can put you at risk for higher blood sugar and you may not recognize that, right? Or you may not know that. So um, it is possible to have your genes be part of the blood sugar issue as well. But we want to be careful that we don't blame it all on our genes because right. there's not one diabetic gene, right? There's not even two diabetic genes. There is a whole host of genes that interact to keep your blood sugar high or keep your blood sugar low. When you combine them with your environment, which is your food, your alcohol, your sleep, your stress, your movement. But right. nutrigenomics is a fascinating area and I'm using it more and more with my clients as well because it gives another piece of information to that puzzle. Just like right. the continuous glucose monitor adds another level of information to the puzzle to, to figure out everybody's puzzle. That's beautiful. And how are you using nutrigenomics? What kind of testing are you incorporating in your practice? Well, there are a couple of labs that I use. One lab that I use a lot is DNA labs, and they um, do a panel where a whole bunch of panels where you would look at your um, tolerance for carbohydrates, your tolerance for various kinds of fat, like saturated fat and unsaturated fat. Mm -hmm. um, keto, of course, is a really popular diet. Um, and what I find, and, and it can be very effective. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. can be a very effective, especially in the short term for weight loss. The challenge is long term. Um, I also find a lot of people don't have the right genetic makeup to have that much saturated fat for a long time. It starts to affect their um, HDL and their LDL and, and potentially heart disease down the line. So, um, but we look at in the in the nutrigenomics, we look at your carbohydrate sensitivity, your fat sensitivity, your appetite and insulin markers as well, um, as well as some of your detox markers too, because that is gonna affect uh, the toxin load in the body, which can also be involved in blood sugar mm -hmm. in a negative way. Is, the, is that the one that's uh, operated by Mansoor? No, that's the DNA company. That's the DNA company. Uh, yeah, DNA I, work with, I work with Mansoor as well. Yeah, that's okay. the DNA company. But DNA Labs is another one. Um, that's um, Aaron Goldberg and, and Robin Murphy are on the scientific uh, advisory committee. And so I do work with them in terms of um, walking their clients through their genetic report and helping them understand what does that mean in terms of diet and food. Okay. And well, this is a perfect segue into you know, the person has the type one diabetes, because mm -hmm. um, that can be genetically, correct? Can that be diabetes uh, too? Can, can that come genetically? Or, well, yes, I guess it can. But no, no but see, I don't, there's not a gene for type one. There is, okay. that's pancreatic insufficiency. I mean, your beta cells are just not producing right. insulin. Okay, so let's talk that, no, so that's type one. And we'll talk about the difference between type one and type two. Um, Right. So type one is an autoimmune situation. So your body is um, something is attacked the beta cells. Sometimes it's uh, can develop post a serious viral infection. Um, it, often it develops in childhood, but more and more we're seeing sort of the autoimmune diabetes hitting in adults as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but what the long, the, the short end of it is that it, the cells in the pancreas that produce insulin no longer produce insulin and then you need to have injections of insulin because we absolutely need to have insulin to survive in right. small amounts. Yeah, right. yeah. Right. So if you can share about like, you know, uh, that insulin is really, you know, a hormone, correct? Mm -hmm. so, and how insulin really works in our body and uptakes the glucose. So we can talk yes. about that kind of. 
So if we think back to what I said about carbohydrates, when we digest carbohydrates down into the glucose molecules, those glute, that sugar ends up in the bloodstream and that stimulus of rising blood sugar stimulates the pancreas to secrete insulin. And insulin's job is essentially to take the sugar out of the blood and put it in the cells where it can get used for energy. So it's crucial that we have insulin. And when everything is, is working well, the blood sugar comes back down after you eat and everything goes back to homeostasis. What happens over time and how type 2 diabetes develops is that that insulin signaling that allows the sugar into the cell after a while doesn't work anymore. Is it because the receptors are getting tired? Potentially. Is it because the cell is trying to protect itself from too much sugar and all the damage that can happen with too much energy? That's another theory as well. So there are a whole bunch of theories why you develop something called insulin resistance, which means that the cells no longer hear that insulin signaling. They become resistant to that insulin message. And when that happens, the blood sugar can't get out of the blood and into the cells. So it starts rising in the bloodstream. But what happens before that in type 2 diabetes is that in the pro before the blood sugar starts to rise, insulin will start to rise. Because in the early stages of insulin resistance, when the cells are starting not to hear that insulin message, the pancreas says, hmm, I think I better push out more insulin. I've got to knock louder at the door of the cell to get that sugar in. So I'm going to produce a lot more insulin. So what happens first is our insulin rises but blood sugar stays normal. And then eventually over time, the insulin stays high and the blood sugar goes high. So a very good test to do blood in blood work to see where you are on that spectrum, because it's a spectrum of blood sugar dysfunction, is what is your fasting insulin? If your fasting insulin is high and your blood sugar is normal, then you are on your way to insulin resistance, or you likely already have insulin resistance, but it's working enough to keep your blood sugar normal. But over time, your blood sugar will likely start to rise. Okay. So it's a test that can give you an indication of whether or not you're going to develop prediabetes and diabetes five years down the road. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great test. And I guess, you know, a lot of our local docs, they, they don't want to even do it, right? They it's just, a great test. It's a great test. Typically and traditionally, it's only been done in diabetics and people with diabetes. Um, I push for it all the time now because I want to see where on the spectrum that person is. Right. How far down the road towards problems are we are we already? Right. And I, I think that's really important, especially when it comes to like cardiometabolic, because I do a NMR lipo profile, mm -hmm. which gives me that LPI RR score. And you know, yeah. that lipoprotein insulin resistance score is really important. Um, you know, we, now we're talking on a physiological and cellular level, but there's these warning signals, if you can talk about, that happens that people don't even pay attention to, you know, where, you know, after lunch, you know, their head's different, yeah. you know, they're out, you know. So there's a lot of warning signals that are occurring on a physiological level, symptoms, but did people just think it's like it's a norm. So if we can talk about the warning signals. Yeah, so the warning signals of blood sugar dysfunction. And so instead of calling instead of going right to the diabetes end of things let's call it blood sugar dysfunction because that's a whole spectrum right. one end of the spectrum you have perfect blood sugar at the other end of the spectrum you have full blown type 2 diabetes but in the middle there there's a whole bunch of wiggle room kind of things so some of those symptoms that you're talking about um are you, do you within a couple of hours after eating do you get hangry you know do you get that irritable Maybe you even get shaky and headachey uh, and feel like you're going to pass out if you don't have something to eat. That's a pretty good indication that your blood sugar has gone really high and come plummeting down. So that's not a good thing for, for blood sugar as well. Um, uh, so the shaky, dizzy, uncomfortable brain fog kind of thing, the nodding off that you were just doing after a meal high in carbohydrates. So if you have a sandwich or you have a bowl of pasta or you have some pasta salad or something like that, you know, within an hour, are you nodding off at your desk? That's a pretty good indication, again, that your blood sugar has gone way up and it's coming, it's coming down quickly. So um, those are the sort of the ones that you might pass off as, oh, I'm just tired. I didn't sleep very well last night. Or 
uh, oh no, I've always been this way. I need to eat every two hours. Or if I don't, then I have a headache. That's just the way I am. Right. Well, <laughs> it is the way you are because you're also creating that by your food. Right. Yeah. People so, tell me all the time, right? Like, I'm hypoglycemic. I need to eat every two hours. You don't understand, Dr. Gay. I'm like, well, I, I, maybe you don't need to eat every two hours, you know? And you Well, know, so. then the question becomes, what are you eating? Because exactly. if you're eating just straight carbohydrates, yeah, you do need to eat every two hours right. so that you don't crash. But if we change the food that you're eating and make sure you're getting enough protein and some good fats and a whole bunch of fiber, then likely over, you know, the first couple of days can be uncomfortable. But after the first couple of days, you are not hungry anymore and um, can go from meal to meal. We should be able to go four hours without mm -hmm. eating at least. Um, it's eating properly. Any it, when we eat properly, yeah, right, yeah. Right, right. For the most part, right. most people should be able to do that. Right, you know, but I think you know we're so marketed, you know, that three meals a day and snacks and so forth. I mean, remember for years we thought, you know, you need to graze, you need to eat every two hours, and it keeps your blood sugar level. And it well, it never really kept it, just kept it up and up and down and up more and up more. And you know, no, I know, crazy. So, I, I wish I had a, a chart here, but um, if we think about after every meal, we're eating some carbohydrates. So our blood sugar naturally will go up when those carbohydrates get digested. And then our blood sugar will come down if we have enough time before the next meal. So ideally, we'd like our blood sugar to be here, come up and come back down to the same spot right. in, within a couple of hours. So and that's why I really only recommend three meals a day to people at the most. If we snack in the middle there, so the blood sugar goes up, and then it's on its way down and then we have a snack. So what happens? It goes back up again and then it comes partly down. Then we have lunch. And so over the whole day, the blood sugar averages a lot higher than if we had a meal and allowed it to come down, had another meal and allowed it to come down. Right. So when we snack a lot, yeah, that idea of it keeps our blood sugar stable. Well, yeah, but stable high. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Now, and, and there lies the problem, right? You know, it's yeah. like, constantly stoking the fire right you, yeah you, you know and you don't want to do it because you know the whole thing you know leads to this underlying inflammatory response and all that so you know it's important to you know have that blood sugar you know come down to that stabilization that homeostasis level and then you know your next meal not your next snack that's why i'm not not a big fan of grazing so before we talk about you know the blood work that i think is really important to perform can you talk a little bit about hypoglycemia Right. So hypoglycemia is uh, when the blood sugar drops very low. And, the, and a lot of people say, well, I have reactive hypoglycemia. So reactive hypoglycemia means the blood sugar tends to go up quite high, but then comes crashing down and can end up lower than your, where you originally started. That may be a signal that you are producing a lot of insulin, that you are on the insulin resistance spectrum and at the beginning of it because you're producing a lot of insulin. So that insulin is moving the sugar out of the blood very quickly. And your blood sugar numbers can change very quickly. It's coming down very quickly, which can make us feel woozy and uh, shaky and dizzy and all of that kind of stuff. And then when we hit the bottom, we bottom out, we feel like we're going to pass out, we have a headache, we, we're hangry, we're all of the above. And give me some food fast. And usually it's sugar or grains or carbohydrates. And then our blood sugar goes up and we feel better. Okay, but if we didn't eat the super high carbohydrates, we won't usually end up in that hypoglycemia state. Mm -hmm. So if we have enough protein every time we eat and some good fats every time we eat, the, the curves are a lot less steep and we don't end up in that hypoglycemia. So for the people that say, yes, I have hypoglycemia, we can fix that by making sure that you are formulating your meals correctly. Right. But a lot of people who say they're hypoglycemic, they don't even feel, well, I can't get diabetes. That's hyperglycemic, right? They feel like they, they won't get it, but they don't understand that that's like, this is your starting point. This is, this is the beginning where, you know, you can easily end up this way. So, you know, when we're talking about blood work, would your blood work be different for assessing somebody for hypo versus hyper? What kind of blood work panel do you like to use to get that overall picture? Like I said, in, in my area, they won't do the fasting insulin. After time I asked the patient, did anybody do your hemoglobin A1C? They're like, no, no need to. I'm right. Like, okay. You know, 
like, all right, well, I, I yeah, believe yeah. me, you know, yeah. for sure, but. So the, the test that is done uh, as, a, as a matter of course is fasting glucose, right? Fasting mm -hmm. blood sugar. So what that tells us is how much sugar is in your body after you haven't eaten for 12 hours. So that doesn't really help us understand how your body processes carbohydrates and how your blood sugar responds because it's a test that is 12 hours after the last thing you ate. Kind of crazy. And it can be normal and normal and normal and normal even though you have blood sugar dysfunction, even though you have, you're on your way to prediabetes and diabetes. So that's one piece. It's a very unimportant piece for me. And if that's the only piece I have on blood work, doesn't tell me that much, right. right? The next piece I like, if I can get it, is the fasting insulin that we just talked about, because that helps me understand where on the spectrum we are in your pancreas, what's, ha what's going on there. And then the hemoglobin A1C that you mentioned, what that one is, is essentially a three month window into how high your blood sugar has been during that time, whether it's spiked or whether it's gone up and stayed high. So it's a combination of all of those. And the reason it's a three month window is that hemoglobin A1C is a, num is a percentage and it's the percentage of your red blood cells that have sugar permanently bonded to them. So the higher your blood sugar, of course, the more chance you've got more red blood cells that have sugar right stuck right to them. Mm -hmm. um, and red blood cells live for three months. That's why it's about a three month window. It's, it's not quite a three month window, but it's pretty close. So that is a good piece because if your hemoglobin A1C is higher than normal or near the top end of the normal range, then that says that you've spiked a lot or you've had a consistently high blood sugar quite a quite a bit of the time. Those are the sort of normal tests, if you will. The other test that is really good to do, but is really not done anymore, except if you're pregnant, is the glucose challenge, mm -hmm. where you drink a glucose solution, you drink a sugar solution, they take your blood first, you drink a glucose solution, and then they take your blood every hour or every half hour for about two to three hours, and they get to see what that curve looks like. If you can get that test, it's fantastic because it really shows you what happens with the blood sugar, but what makes it even better is if they will draw insulin and do test insulin at the same time so we can see both curves. Nice. That's really gonna tell us how far down the road you are towards blood sugar dysfunction. So that's a really cool one. You know, we look a lot at the hemoglobin A1C. Uh, like I said, we look at the NMR lipo profile with the lipoprotein insulin resistance score. We have a person that's coming in and we already know that hemoglobin A1C is at an eight. Yeah. So and an eight for, for listeners is is high. It's high. An eight is full on, full on type well, two diabetes. Full on diabetic. And, you know, when I look at the lipid panel, as you can imagine, that's in a total disarray, right? So it's not like just the total cholesterol, everything that, any marker that could be off is off, right? So, you know, when you're dealing with that kind of patient, you're already full-blown cardiometabolic, you're in it. So, you know, let's talk a little bit about that kind of presentation with visceral fat versus subcutaneous fat and diabetes, because somebody could be thin, have the appearance of thin, and have diabetes, and somebody can be obese and have diabetes, right? Yeah. So it's just not be obese enough. and not have diabetes and not have diabetes, right? So yeah. you know, that's again, where that genetics, you know, I think, you know, really plays a, a role in that. Um, you know, we have people that come in and you look at their BMI, the BMI is off the chart, but their blood work is it's wonderful. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. I know. It's very interesting. It's very interesting. The, um, uh, sorry, I, Subcutaneous versus subcutaneous visceral. and visceral. Yeah. So subcutaneous fat is the fat that's just right under the skin. It's you. It's the fat that you could pinch. Okay. The visceral fat is the fat in the abdomen area, around the rib cage and above the pelvis. That is deep, deep, deep around all your organs. So around your liver, around your spleen, around your pancreas, around your intestines, all of that. And that's the visceral fat. That tends to be more dangerous, if you will, than the subcutaneous fat that's right under the skin. Now we can have a lot of subcutaneous fat and it makes us look fat, but it might not be deep visceral fat. 
We can also be, as you said, we can also be thin and look like we're the right weight and the right size and be completely full of visceral fat as well. Right. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a conundrum there because we've come to rely on BMI as an indication, but that's just weight and height. And your weight could be fat, your weight could be muscle, your weight could be both. You're, you know, do you have enough water in there? So doing a body composition, a full on body composition is a really great thing to be to do as well. Um, but um, we can get an idea of visceral fat sometimes from um, the, body, the, by the composition, but also sort of understanding the lifestyle of the person, their amount of activity and looking at their diet, right? If there are a lot of carbohydrates in there, then we can assume that there may be some visceral fat. And that can lead us to things like fatty liver, Yep. right? And fatty liver, our liver is a really important organ for blood sugar management. I know I talked only about the pancreas secreting insulin, but our liver helps us keep our blood sugar balanced and if we if we don't it's, it's quite a complicated thing in there i'm not sure we want do we want to get into that but um the liver is really important let's just leave it at that the liver is really important for blood sugar so if we end up with fatty liver then everything is compromised in the liver our blood sugar is compromised our detoxification processes are compromised uh, it's but it is reversible as well so you know we've had some patients with nafl d and we had them turn around um, are again, uh, there are some local docs I work with who are absolutely phenomenal. Right. Mm -hmm. And then there are some local docs who just won't budge away from the standard, you know, for lack of a better term, you know, the, the, the company line, yeah. um, you know, you got an apple D, um, here's, here's the drugs diet won't make a difference. You know, lifestyle won't make a difference. And I'm like, okay, can we give it a try at least? Right. I mean, that's really important. So, you know, I want to drive home today, especially the importance of like what diabetes can do, the 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 damage that it just can lay and and, and decimate on a physiological and cellular level. Um, right. Diabetic retinopathy, diabetic neuropathy. I mean, these are things like by the time you got the neuropathy in the feet, I'm like, I, I other than throwing some gab of petting at you, I mean, there's just it's hard to get that under control. Right. Yeah. So if you can yeah. share what your experience would be, if you if you've done anything with the 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 neuropathy that people experience, um, let me know, because I, I need to bring it to some of my patients. Right. Because I, I find that one very challenging. I do find neuropathy challenging, too. So neuropathy is where the the extremities are mostly in the feet, but sometimes it can get in the fingers as well. But mostly in the feet where the nerves get damaged so much by high blood sugar and by high insulin that they start to die off at the nerve endings and we end up with not being able to feel things. So diabetic foot is really diabetic neuropathy. And if you can't feel things in your feet, then you can end up with cuts and lesions and blisters and things like that, that you don't know you have that get infected and don't heal. So amputation, I can't remember the exact statistics, but non-accident diabetes is responsible for the highest amount of non-accident non-accident related amputations mm -hmm. in North America. Yes. That's scary. You That's lose right. your fingers or not your fingers, but you lose your toes and potentially your whole feet, yep. and potentially up to your knees because of diabetes. Wow. That's that's pretty scary, and that's a tough one to reverse. The neuropathy mm -hmm. is a really tough one to reverse. The retinopathy is when all the small blood vessels in the eyes die off, and we lose our sight because of high blood sugar right. and high insulin. Both of those together are are do so much damage in the body. You talked about the the lipid numbers and and looking at um, lipids and blood sugar. There's a, there was a Dr. Kraft who in the 50s started looking at insulin and blood sugar and heart disease. And he sort of came to the conclusion that somebody with a heart attack or somebody with heart disease um, was a person with diabetes that had not yet been diagnosed. Hmm. So he was equating insulin and blood sugar as the root cause of most heart disease. Yeah, I mean, again, my family was a cardiometabolic family, all went hand in hand from 
hypertension to heart disease to stroke to diabetes. I mean, it was just one right after the other. And, you know, the, the minute they started one medication, I knew what was coming next. Yeah. Right. It's just, just a, that's just the norm. And when we see that now, you know, you, we, you start metformin, we're soon going to be on, you know, uh, Crestor and then, you know, some kind of statin. And then, you know, you'll be on the central with hydrochlorothiazide. It's just, it's just the physiological setting that we see time and time and time again. And I'm thinking, well, if you're already on one, let's see what we can do to stop. Yeah. We get on the other two, right? Let's see what we yeah. can do to change. At least maybe if you're just not on, on, on you know, so much of, of metformin or glucophage, you know, if we get you where they can, where your hemoglobin A1C comes down and they can lessen the dosage, that's okay too. You know, that's very acceptable. You know, so we talked about the eyes, we talked about um, the feet that can affect it, you know, the numbness, tingling, um, but also kidney disease too, right? I mean, yeah. because again, the small vessels in the kidneys are very sensitive to that blood sugar and the insulin, and that can get damaged too. And then, yeah, kidney failure is, is a disaster. So, or reduced kidney function is a disaster. So all of these things can be, um, at the very least stopped in their tracks. It doesn't mean they can necessarily be reversed, but right. pretty much everything can be stopped so that there's no further deterioration if you completely change your diet. But the whole idea is let's get it way beforehand, right? right? Let's get it way beforehand. We also know from studies that the, the, the changes in the eye happen even with an A1C in the normal range. So you don't even have to be pre-diabetic or working towards diabetes to have sugar-related changes in your eyes. Right, right. And then let's not forget uh, the damage you can do to the gums and teeth. Mm -hmm. Right. That, that's another one. Um, cancer. Yeah. You know, you'll see it's a and, cancer. Um, yeah. Now, how do you feel about, you know, for, for now quite a few years we've been hearing, you know, Alzheimer's disease, they refer to it as like the type 3 diabetes. How do you feel about that? Well, um, we in one of the clinics that I work at, we have an Alzheimer's program based on Dr. Perlmutter's uh, oh, program. Great, great, great book. And um, the key to that from a diet perspective is to be very low carb, if not keto. So what we do know is that we can have insulin resistance in the brain. We didn't know that until about 15 years ago. And now we know that we can have insulin resistance in the brain. So it works the same way as in the rest of the body. The energy can't get in to be used appropriately and we end up with cognitive issues. So if we lower the blood sugar, we lower the insulin, which means we lower the insulin resistance and hopefully reverse it. It also means we lower inflammation because both high blood sugar and high insulin are very inflammatory. And so um, when we lower inflammation, everything works better too. And we don't have all those signaling the the, the um, inflammatory signaling molecules traveling throughout the body and causing all sorts of damage too. So um, yeah, I, I is it is that the only thing that there is with Alzheimer's? No, no, there are lots of other things. Um, it can be again, it's very, it's very individual. So when we look at Alzheimer's, we want to look at your to toxin load, we want to look at your sugar load, we want to look at your hormones and are they complete too? So you can be sort of any combination of those. I think Dr. Bredesen talks about, is it four or five types of Alzheimer's? And I think other people even have more types than that. So it depends on what is the predominant problem for you. Is it your blood sugar? Is it the toxins you've been exposed to? Is it the viruses you've had that might end up in the brain? We do know that some of the herpes viruses end up in the brain. Um, is it that your hormones are completely out of whack? And we know that hormones are very important for longevity of the brain as well. Right. Yeah. Now, do you like to look at like the APOE4 genes and stuff like that? Does your, does your work, when you do your genetic testing, does it look at that? Yes, it does. Yeah, absolutely. So the APOE4 gene, um, if you have one, remember we have two copies of each gene. So if you have one of those, and again, I don't have the statistics off the top of my head. You have um, quite an increased risk of, of developing Alzheimer's disease. If you have two copies of it, you have a, a very accelerated risk of developing Alzheimer's. Doesn't mean you necessarily will, but you have a much higher risk if you don't take proactive, if you don't act proactively. But just because we don't have the Alzheimer's gene also doesn't mean that we won't get it. 
right? We can oh, get Alzheimer's absolutely without the Alzheimer's genes. And I don't know what those statistics are, but it would be interesting to know what percentage of people with Alzheimer's actually do have APOE4 and what percentage don't and how many copies. Right. So, um, but not everybody's testing for that in, in, uh, in any kind of, in every medical practice. So we don't, we wouldn't really know those statistics. Right. And in, in some patients, you know, I, I give them that opportunity because sometimes we do take a look at that. Um, but some do not want to know because uh, they're afraid if they know, then they feel be, you know, self-perpetuating. And the one time they forget their keys, they're like, oh my God, this is the start of it. And just the weight of that alone is too much stress. Well, and it may very well be. Yeah. It may very well be. Right. right. So right. Um, I can understand that to a certain extent. Right. I, I think I'd want to know, but I do, I can empathize with that sure. position. Yeah. Sure. And, you know, yeah. and the thing is, I, I often say, you know, whether it is or it isn't, we can't go wrong by improving your lifestyle, period. Exactly. Whether it's there, if it's there and we improve your lifestyle, we did wonderful. If it's not there, we improve your lifestyle, we still did wonderful, right? That's right. And today we did still okay and that's okay, you know? And we talk about lifestyle, one thing I'm talking about is like, often patients will say, but Dr. K, this one doesn't have sugar in it, it's got the neutral sweet, so, you know, I don't have to worry about, you know, affecting me at all. So it, I know how I feel about artificial sweeteners. <laughs> uh, I'm guessing you pretty much feel the same way I do. Um, I do. I, about that. I do from a, from a whole bunch of perspectives. Um, when artificial sweeteners first came in, it was all about calories, right? So if we reduce calories, then we don't have as much weight gain. And that was sort of what we, in the 70s, 60s, 70s, when these sweeteners first started coming in. Okay, so... But we know that weight gain or weight loss is not only about the calories in and calories out. It's about your metabolism and what you do with those calories and where they come from. So, um, but what we know about artificial sweeteners now is that, yes, they might not have any effect on blood sugar because they don't have any, they're, they're acaloric, they don't have any calories in them. But what we do know is that they can affect insulin. And we know that with a whole bunch of these sweeteners, you get an insulin response when you have them, even though you don't get a blood sugar response. And that's bad too, because yes, your blood sugar is not going up, but your insulin's going up. So that message on the cell door is of increased insulin, which can contribute to your insulin resistance over time. We also, there was one interesting study that was done with sucralose mm -hmm. and it had um, the subjects have sucralose with their meal and it tested Splenda. their blood sugar. Splenda, yeah. yeah. Splenda. Okay had it with their meal and they tested their blood sugar. And then they tested the blood sugar after the next meal that did not have any Splenda in it and was just a, 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 a prescribed, a pre-prescribed meal. And what they found was that after the second meal, the people that had the Splenda at the first meal had a much higher blood sugar response to that second meal. Hmm. So it's not, only the meal in which you're eating it or the coffee in which you're having it or whatever. It's not just that moment in time, but it's later where there's an effect too, which boggles my mind. And, and so it's not just now it's every single time. So imagine if you have Splenda every morning in your coffee and then you have a bowl of cereal, right? So it's not the Splenda in your coffee. You're not getting any response from that, but you're getting way more, blood sugar response than you normally would from an already high carbohydrate breakfast. Mm -hmm. So that's concerning. That right. is concerning over time. Right. So um, that's one, that's a couple of pretty good reasons that I don't like the blood sugar, the, the sweeteners, but I also from um, an evolutionary perspective, we are programmed to like sweet mm -hmm. because if you think back to our ancestors, hunting and gathering their food, sweet meant calories and calories meant survival. So we are programmed to like that sweet. We don't have that issue anymore with survival in North America for the most part. Of course, there's hunger and, sure. but for the most part, we don't have that issue. So when we have constant sweet, we are not acting with the way our genes evolved. And I think we have yet to uncover some of those very serious consequences of constant exposure exposure to sweet. Right. It makes you want more. Sure. And, right. And that's what, like on, like on our elimination protocols, I, I don't want any type of sweetener because once the brain gets a little bit of a taste, right, 
whether it's you know a fake one, a natural one, whatever. Once it gets a little bit of taste, we need to feed the beast, right? You want more and more and more and more. So you know, I'm I'm with you. I, you know, I, I figured we were in the same camp with that. I just I just always found it to be nasty. You know, and so many claims are healthy, but I see them drinking a diet soda. Um, well, and even stevia, I don't like people to use too much stevia. I agree. You know, um, not only from the chemical potential chemical issues with stevia, but even if there aren't any of those, it's still that sweet taste. And you're right. still priming yourself all the time to look for that sweet taste. Right, right. So I really like it only to come from whole fruit. And then even that, depending on the particular makeup of the person, we might have to limit as well. Right. You know, I always find it interesting, especially when we do our, our elimination protocols. And obviously, you know, they're done with the sugar, they're done with the grains, they're done with the dairy. And you know, the the, the emotion that's tied in with that, right? That this this I, I got to have this anger. I, I, it's missing. I'm I'm deprived. They often feel they're deprived. I'm like, hey, listen, you're eating food. You can eat you can eat a ton of food. You know, we just don't want you to have this. So I always felt like if you're coming off something, you're having a reaction to that, probably shouldn't be in your diet. I mean, just, you know, you can go yeah. with that, eating broccoli, not freak out, you know? I mean, yeah, it's crazy. Changing our diet is really hard. It it's is. Really hard. It's, it, I'm, listen, I've been working on this since ninth grade. Yeah, um, it's really yeah. hard to change our the way we eat. So uh, we have to recognize that and we have to come into it with the mindset of what am I trying to accomplish from this and what's my ultimate goal, right? So if I'm coming in with, well, don't take away my coffee, don't take away my alcohol, don't take away my snack, don't take away, I'm not going to do any of those things, then I don't know if the if health is a really, uh, is a priority for right. you, right? right? So I work a lot on mindset with people too, because it is tough to change our diet. Um, it's different than anything else because we do have to eat at least once a day, right. maybe not every day, but you know, fasting is another thing, but, um, we do have to eat to survive, right? We don't have to drink coffee to survive. We don't have to drink alcohol to survive. Nope. We don't have to do any, you know, we have to eat to survive. We have to drink water to survive. So that makes it a bit different than eliminating other things from our lives, like smoking or alcohol or whatever. Yeah. Sure. And, but, but sometimes it's, it's difficult for the patient if the other people or other person in the house is not following pro. I mean, that's like, you know, my husband's mm -hmm. eating Oreos and she's trying to die. I mean, that's just, that is darn, darn difficult, you know, and we have to have that conversation as well with the significant other saying, hey, you know, do you want your significant other to be healthy? Okay. If you do, here's how we need you to help. Please don't have this in the house. You know, because it's yeah. not it's not fair, right? And we see that we see that quite a bit, actually. We do see it a lot. I see it a lot too. Um, people don't like when the dance is changed, right? right. The, you know, it it changes the pattern. It changes your relationship with that other person, and it can change it for the better. But it still changes it. Right. So yeah, sabotage, whether it's conscious or not, um, unfortunately, is rampant. <laughs> Right. It is. It is. Yeah. And it's something yeah. that we have to deal with as, as practitioners. And, you know, I, I feel for the patients when they're in that position. Um, it, let, let's talk about something that you touched on. You know, we're talking about the macros, right? The, mm. the fats, the carbohydrates, the protein. I find a lot of my patients do not eat enough protein. They're just not eating, especially as I, as you and I were talking before we hopped on, you know, our vegan and vegetarian patients who I understand, I understand where they're coming from, from an, uh, uh, an empathic perspective. I understand where they're coming from, from a philosophical perspective, but my gosh, a lot of them just are not, are not healthy. They want to be healthy because we're told if you are a vegan or vegetarian and you eat this way, you'll be healthy, but their, their blood work and the way they feel and the way they present clinically doesn't always match up to being healthy. Um, no. So we can yeah. talk, talk about that because we know that, you know, plant protein, you don't have the same amino acid profile as, you do with uh, an animal protein. Um, and a vegetarian can be a diabetic too. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. So protein, it's not that we need a ton of protein, but we do need the adequate amounts. And those amino acids, are, those are the, in, just as carbohydrates are made up of glucose molecules, proteins are made up of things called amino acids. And so we need, there are eight, nine, eight essential amino acids, meaning that the body, we need to eat them. They, the body can't make them. So if we don't eat them, 
the body can't make certain things like immune cells or hormones or any of these things. So we absolutely need the right amount of protein. It doesn't mean we need to be eating a steak at every meal or every day even or every week even or anything like that. But from a plant-based protein, we have to pay attention more if we're eating just a plant-based diet because we've got to make sure that we're getting some of those higher protein um, foods. So are we getting enough beans and lentils? If we are just eating grains, if we are a vegan or a vegetarian, and we're just eating pasta, and vegetarian pizza, and, you know, some carrot sticks and stuff like that, we are not feeding the body well. It's the same as if you're an omnivore, and you're only eating steak, like you're, it's not, it's just not going to work in the long run. So, yeah, we as a as a plant based person, you've got to make sure that you're get you're not just eating grain, that you're eating actually eating lentils and beans, you're actually eating hemp seeds, you're actually eating high protein vegetables, and you're not eating too much grain. You're not a grain grains vegetarian. You're but a vegetarian. Grains are, grains are we're told grains are good, but grains are good for you. That it says it right there. Grains are healthy. How do you think I poop? Healthy whole grains. Right. I know. So not so healthy for some people, right. um, potentially healthy for other people. Are there good vitamins and minerals and nutrients in, in grains? Absolutely. Absolutely. But most of us aren't eating intact grains, right? Most of us aren't eating steel cut oats. We're eating instant oatmeal. Or most an oatmeal of cookie. Pardon? Or an oatmeal cookie, right? Or an oatmeal cookie, right? right. And people eat that. Yeah, we're not eating wheat berries, the actual wheat grain of wheat. We're eating bread that's been made from ground up wheat. We're not eating um, black rice or red rice or wild rice. We're eating white rice. You know, we're not eating um, pot barley. We're eating pearled barley. So all of these have been processed um, in, in a certain way. But yeah, it is difficult from a plant-based perspective. Um, to get that message across, but but what the message is is you can do it well, but you have to pay attention and ensure that you're getting enough protein and not too many grains. So, with your vegetarian or vegan patients, will you recommend a like a pea protein, a hemp protein, a pea and rice protein? I mean, potentially, if if they are ve vegan, then yes, I probably will because as a vegan, if you're not if you're not eating some kind of um, maybe not eating eggs, maybe not eating any dairy or anything like that, then yes, you probably do need some kind of high quality uh, plant-based protein. At the very least, you need to include lentils and beans as the foundation of your meals with nuts and seeds and with hemp seeds and still keep the grains out. A vegetarian meal isn't rice with a few vegetables. A good vegetarian meal is lentils with a whole bunch of vegetables and no rice. Right. So that brings us to the paleo lifestyle. So can you talk about the paleo lifestyle, how that's different from the carnivore lifestyle? And we already talked about vegetarian and vegan. So can you talk about a little bit about the paleo lifestyle? So paleo is based on the idea that if we, um, that we evolved a certain way over time as human beings, and if we eat to uh, the way that we evolved genetically, then hopefully we'll have better health. And we didn't have agriculture in as humans until about 10,000 years ago. And agriculture is, is a means where we grow grains uh, and where we have animal husbandry. So where we end up with dairy as well. So milk and, and cheese and that kind of stuff. Up until that point for millions and millions of years, we survived on what we could hunt and what we could catch and what we could pick and what we could gather, right? So, Paleo means that there are no grains in your diet at all because grains only came in about 10,000 years ago. Paleo means that there's no dairy, dairy in your diet because, again, that only came in about 10,000 years ago. Paleo means there's no sugar except maybe honey because our ancestors might have found a, a beehive every now and then, right? Um, and it also means there's no lentils and beans, which 
you know, you could modify there because again, those were mostly coming from agriculture, but we could argue that you found tubers and things like that when you were hunting and gathering. So a strict paleo is not gonna have those. I usually, I usually use a modified paleo with most people where depending on their blood sugar situation, lentils and beans might be part of it as well. Gotcha. So really what it means is you're eating animal protein, you're eating a lot of vegetables, you're eating fruits, you're eating nuts and seeds, and you're eating good natural oils. And, and, and also a part of the lifestyle though is good sleep and good exercise too. Yes, but that's not specific just to paleo. Correct. Right, that could be, that could be uh, an omnivore is that way, a carnivore, oh. you know, a vegan could have good lifestyle right. habits as well too, so. But, did, but let's talk about paleo snacks, right? Because paleo mm -hmm. snacks are healthy. It says paleo on, on, on the bar, right? So yeah. healthy, healthy. Yeah, so marketing, right? Marketing. Right. Um, one thing I always share with people is that food companies are not in the business of health for the most part, even though they say they are a lot of the times. They're in the business of having you as a customer and having you as a repeat customer. And the way they do that is to make something that's delicious. And it might follow the paleo rules. It might not. Right. Um, but there's a lot of paleo junk out there and there's a lot of keto junk out there. Mm -hmm. And we have to be very careful of that because just this, because something says keto doesn't mean that it's not full of just awful things for the body. Um, and so, again, I'm not a big fan of making cookies out of dates and bananas and almond flour, even though that's all paleo. It's still super high carbohydrate and can really disrupt your blood sugar, even though it doesn't have any added sugar. One date, one medjool date has 18 grams of carbohydrates. That's wow. almost four, that's four teaspoons of sugar in one date. Yes, it has all sorts of other nutrients too, but if you have blood sugar problems, that date is going to be a, a real problem. Right. And fresh dates go down so easy too. I mean, <laughs> you can just, you can just turn them one right after the other, right? Eating them, right? Or, or prunes or any, di any dried fruit, dried mm -hmm. apricots. Oh my goodness. So yeah, amazing. You know, it is natural, it is no added sugar, but it's still a lot of sugar. So we do have to be careful and we have to pay attention and think for ourselves, not let the food manufacturers think for us. Right. And and this leads into one of, the, one of the statements that you said in the book, which I absolutely loved, you know, is rip off the Band-Aid, right? You know, because a lot of people, well, I'm just going to, I'm going to like work my way into this little by little by little. But you've already been diagnosed, you're getting close to it, it's already present. And you, you, you talk about that, you know, rip off the band-aid approach. Yeah. It is what I find to be most successful with most people. It's hard. Mm -hmm. The first week is hard. Maybe even the first three days, but week uh, at the most is usually hard. Um, but then you feel better and you and you all of a sudden are thinking a different way. You start to see results very quickly and that keeps you motivated. The little bit at a time, it can work. And not to say that it doesn't, but it can work. It takes more willpower because you're not seeing changes. Well, I stopped my banana every morning. So why am I not seeing, you know, why am I, why am I not down five pounds this right, week? Right. And why is my blood sugar still high? Right. So if you want to see results quickly and stay motivated, then I love the rip off the band-aid too. Let's dive right in. Let's eat for your blood sugar starting tomorrow, starting your next meal rather, um, so that you can feel better sooner. Yeah. yeah. I like the pull off the band-aid for sure. Yeah. I, th I thought that was great. And we have to touch on an, another topic. Um, and we, I mean, it's a whole nother you know, hour we could do, but <laughs> just like a brief helicopter review is the importance of fasting. Um, I think uh, we want to discuss. Well, so when we think about that blood sugar curve that we talked about before between the meals, the blood sugar comes up when we eat and it goes down when we don't eat. So if we don't eat for a longer period of time, like in a fast, our blood sugar stays down here. And that means that we're not requiring the body to release insulin very much. And so the cells stay sensitive to that insulin signal. So the next time you eat it, res they respond very well. So fasting can help us keep our blood sugar under control. It can help us keep our insulin resistance under control and keep those messages coming in loud and clear. Excellent. Plus, potentially it lowers our calories if that's what we're after at the same time. Right. 
can't can't go wrong. And I tell people, listen, if you just did like you know twelve hours, just like you're you know fasting for blood work, right? Right. So this is what I ask most, not not most, absolutely all of my clients, regardless of why they're coming to see me, whether it's blood sugar or not, is um, twelve hours fasting every single night. That's not really fasting. That's what right. we just should be doing. Right. Because eating at night, eating after dinner, is what North America does mm -hmm. in front of the TV. Mm -hmm front of our screens. We do that. We all do that. It's comforting. It's, you know, it's, it's a way we relax. It's when we relax with the family. It's when we relax by ourselves or whatever the situation. Um, and uh, we let down our guard at that time. So there's a huge amount of calories that go in after dinner and it's all carbohydrates and fat. Right. We're not snacking on broccoli. <laughs> right? And we're not usually snacking on a steak or a piece of chicken or something like that late at night. So, um, when we eat after dinner, then our body's busy digesting through the night and it never gets to the rest restoration and repair mechanisms that should happen when we have that 12 hour fast. Yeah. So not just from a blood sugar perspective, but from a whole body functioning perspective, we need to not eat for 12 hours in a row every day, at least. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that's, that's great. I mean, for a lot of patients, we want them to do that. If they can meet me halfway and start like every other night. I mean, they just. Exactly. I always start where people are. Start. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. So mm -hmm. how can everybody get in touch with you? I am on uh, social media, just at Jill Hillhouse. And my website is jillhillhouse.com. Okay. And then one more time, can you talk about your book, where they can get your book? The Paleo Diabetes Diet Solution is available on Amazon um, and it is available in various stores. But after the last 18 months, I'm not exactly sure where because the store, um, the, in, the in-person shopping hasn't been there. So I'm not sure what stores have it in stock right now, but certainly it's on Amazon.com. Great. Fantastic. And I love the recipes in the book as well. Uh, Thank you. Very doable, very real recipes. That was great. And before I let you go, my last question is, aside from reading your book, what health book would you recommend somebody to read that would change their life, would at least make them think differently? That's a great question. I love the book, The um, Disease Dilemma by Dr. Jeffrey Bland. Ah, excellent. excellent. He is, um, it, just, it just makes you think about all, all these different diseases, all the chronic diseases, his agenda is really just for to be informed to improve your health. He's not pushing a particular diet. He's not pushing a particular supplement. He's not, he's just pushing health. And um, he is sort of the pioneer of functional medicine, essentially. And uh, yeah, the disease dilemma by Dr. Jeffrey Bland. Excellent. Excellent. So thank you very, very much. I had a wonderful evening. This was great information. And we could go for another hour. We could go sure. on and on. Thanks, um, Michael. <laughs> you know, it, it was really good. I think people will get a lot out of this. So uh, everybody have a great night and we'll see you soon. All right. Perfect. Thanks so much. Take Thanks. care.